Thank you for joining and following along a little fireside chat with us here at Level Effect today. Today is going to be a continuation in our series for all of you attendees at the Level Effect School of Advanced Cyber Maneuvering. Uh, today we're going to be discussing a little bit about adversaries and advanced threats, give you a little bit of a briefing on that, uh, talk a little bit about what we do as well too, and some things that you can do to keep yourselves a little bit more safe. And um, there is a Q&A feature in this chat as well too, just in the bottom. Um, you can put some questions up there and we'll get to it. Uh, we'll either answer them live or individually, but please feel free to participate. This is very much uh, an encouraged active session. All right. So a little bit uh, of the agenda for today. Um, as you can see, there is a little bit of a Top Gun theme going on. Um, it is a fantastic movie. Make sure that you are well versed in that movie for this field. <laughs> Don't quote me on that, uh, but we're going to be covering a little bit of the uh, introductions first, then we're going to talk uh, a little bit briefly about that cyber landscape and then dive right into adversary tactics and um, really just sort of get some, I guess, more familiarity out there and pull the curtain back in the veil of really kind of what's happening and um, demystify some of the things going on with adversaries and the tactics that they use. We'll touch base a little bit about who the hackers actually are. Um, and then a little bit of that self-help that I mentioned and the CDA bootcamp that we have. And then we'll cover some more of the Q&A at the end of things that pop up. Kick it off. We'll uh, start off over here with Rob Noth. Hey, everybody. Um, Rob Noth, um, co-founder and one of the instructors at the Level Effect um courses so uh, my past experience is in software development i have a degree in computer science um, but i got my kicks at nsa for the first 10 years of my career um, doing all sorts of things from software development research reverse engineering um, analysis of all kinds of crazy things um, i'm also um, heavily involved at level effect in building the platform and web development and things like that too so i'm happy to uh, engage in all sorts of conversations uh, having to do with software and malware and all sorts of stuff like that. So glad to be here. Thanks, Rob. Glad to have you here as well. <laughs> um, so a little bit about myself. Uh, Anthony Bend is my name. I'm the CEO over at Level Effect, also one of the instructors as well um, for our Cyber Defense Analyst Bootcamp. I'm one of the course creators as well with that. Uh, a little bit about myself, about 13-ish years in the cyber management background. Um, my day-to-day -day right now really looks like leading the operations and content development over at Level Effect. Um, originally more, much more of a security consultant pen tester by trade. I'm definitely more on the offensive side. I like to break stuff and take things apart and mess around with networks and then tell you what's wrong with it. And then I'm also going to tell you how to fix it. That's, that's sort of my forte. That's what I like. And uh, I like getting deep in the nitty gritty of what adversaries like to do and try to emulate them as well too. Cause I think that's pretty fun. Um, OSCP network plus security plus certified as well too. And uh, I'm going to be sort of the main speaker, but I'm also going to pick on Rob and Sarah at times as well, too. And uh, feel free again in the chat. Happy to have you involved in any of the conversations. Thanks, Anthony. Um, so my name is Sarah. I lead the sales and marketing at Level Effect. My background is mostly in obviously sales and marketing, um, but I got my start at Shopify. And so my strengths are really in e-commerce and conversion rates, optimization and websites and all that fun stuff. Um, my role on the team is I try and make things look pretty and sound cool and make sure everyone's having fun, hopefully. So um, yeah, you can try not to ask me too many cybersecurity questions. I'm learning, <laughs> I'm learning as fast as I can, um, but yeah. I will answer any questions as best as I can or direct them to somebody else. <laughs> Thanks, Sarah. She's being humble too. She's actually been through a good chunk of our boot camp. She's got some really good cyber chops. So she knows she knows her way around. Um, but yes, thank you, Sarah. You definitely make sure we have a lot of fun over here at Level Effect. And um, thanks for having you part of this conversation and presentation as well. Um, okay, so 
like I said, I, I saw a couple more people kind of stroll into the attendees as well, too. Thank you again for joining us, uh, maybe on your lunch hour. This is a little bit of a mission briefing for the Level Effect uh, School of Cyber Advanced Maneuvering, and we're going to talk a little bit more about the adversary side, some of the offensive tactics, uh, the threat actors out there in the landscape. Um, to kind of kick things off, and, and we th there's a couple of these slides that we had in part one as well, too, because I think some of the biggest things that we really want to echo and relay is that there really is a pretty uh, solid overlap from the offensive and defensive side of things. And it's just a matter of perspective of how you look at it. You know, uh, last time we talked a little bit about this quote about how cyber power is now really a fundamental fact of global life. And it truly is. Um, I think we're starting to see this a lot more ubiquitous in terms of our day to day life um, in workplaces. It just sort of seems we're getting to that point where cybersecurity itself is going to be something of, you know, just as, as common as your health and safety policy that everyone needs to go to and get informed and trained on and understand what they do and the magnitude of their actions at work. Uh, I think we're seeing more and more day to day this upward trend. I know we can just continue to echo that statement. I'm sure all of you attending are aware as well, too, just the number of incidents and, and breaches that we're seeing on a day to day weekly, monthly, uh, maybe maybe a little too often. And we're gonna talk a little bit about why that's actually happening. Um, but really to kind of hit that point home, you know, cyber power really is an actual thing. And it's, it's, a, it's a skill, it's a resource, not just for individuals, um, but also threat actors, nation states as well too, military, governments, paramilitary, organized crime. There's, there's, a, there's a whole type of different crowd out there as well too. And cyber power is definitely something to be reckoned with in the day of today. So just kind of want to kick us off with that over there. Anthony, if I can mm -hmm. just ask one question, because I know when I was new to cyber, I didn't know what those terms meant, like nation states. Um, yeah. <laughs> and so can you break down some of that stuff that we would hear? Like, who are these things, like people who are actually coming out for organizations? Yeah, thanks, Sarah. Sometimes I might go off some tangents and uh, jargon as well, too. So feel free to stop me, chat anybody. I like to, sometimes I talk too much. But yeah, in terms of nation states, what I'm talking about is government sponsored. So they're are these organizations and sometimes are considered like a sh even shadow organizations or branches of the military that are for all intents and purposes described as not part of the military or not part of the government but they they sort of are and they're these unofficial contractors through the through nation states in the terms of government military and to a lesser extent even organized crime there, there is sort of a background shadow story to all this and when i say nation state essentially what that sort of summarizes are those types of threat actors they're heavily funded uh they're well organized machines and we're not just talking about the media cliche of you know the hacker with a hoodie in a basement we're talking about well-funded professional well-spoken well-dressed well-organized groups of people um, from the tens, the hundreds, to potentially even more. Th these are large groups of individuals that together hit very hard and perform very organized attacks on uh, companies, um, international governments, different types of, of military throughout the, throughout the world. They're sort of targeting them all and they have this overall kind of campaign and it could be a multi-year approach, it could be a single year approach, but I guess long and short is that they are significantly funded and very professional and have a lot of skills at their tool set as a result. And these are the adversaries that are out there right now. And that's what I mean by nation state. All right. <clears throat> so the cyber landscape. Um, for all of you that have sort of seen some of the old windows platforms out there, maybe some of the older versions, maybe some of you have been messing around with 3.1 up to 95, 98, 2003, and so forth. Uh, top left, you're going to see a little image of Windows Server 2003. Underneath it, you're going to see a little image of Windows Server 2012. It looks a lot nicer, um, but for all in intents and purposes, the cyber landscape, if I could summarize what, why we're so vulnerable, why there's so many incidents out there, is that you know, we have this image on the right. That's what it really is. You might have this nice, nice exterior. Things look good. It's polished. It's modern. It's easier to use. A little bit more bells and whistles. You don't have to worry about manually operating anything behind it. Uh, but underneath, it's a very heavily patchworked solution. It's a leaky pipe. 
and we're just basically in a race of when there's a leak detected and something is spitting out of the pipes right now there's someone on our side that is going around and taping it up and trying to implement a solution that hopefully will hold and hopefully won't have another leak um, and that that's that's really realistically where we're at um, a lot of the vulnerabilities and incidents that take place right now uh, by these threat actors by these adversary groups um, and you know even the ones that are exposed by penetration testers and red teamers and stuff that, that are sort of like that ethical hacking crowd that are on the good guys side um, you know we're dealing with vulnerabilities that have been around for some of them decades and the type of attack that is required to be pulled off by these threat actors by these adversaries is not that different under the hood for all intents and purposes it's still pretty much the same plumbing and all we're doing is just putting that duct tape over there's more layers of encryption more layers of encapsulation happening um, encoding but things still operate the same way a lot of these protocols services and ports and different types of network traffic that are happening out there they've been pretty stagnant they've been pretty much the same for uh, for quite some time I think um, Rob could even attest to some of that as well, too. I know he's been involved with some of that uh, development prior to, and uh, I think he's seen a lot of the, this same type of sentiment. Yeah, I mean, I would I would add in there, too, is from the perspective of malware, um, malware really hasn't changed over the years either. Um, sure, like you mentioned, there's kind of new ways of doing things all the time. That's what gets around antiviruses and, and security engineers and EDRs and all advanced machine learning, AI stuff you can throw at it. But in the end, the malware kind of fundamentally still works the same way. Um, most of the same features are used on Windows to achieve the same um, goals. For example, like listing what users are on the machine or trying to find out what other machines are nearby. So when an attacker lands on a computer, they can still look around and see what other computers are available for them to jump to. Um, so, I mean, and that's definitely something that um, I've always sort of adhered to and something I teach a lot is um, learning those foundations and learning the fundamental ways of detecting this malware or finding the malware is critical and it's something that's not being taught um, in, you know, cybersecurity programs and whether you're in college or you're in a boot camp or you're in, you know, taking a Udemy course or YouTube videos, um, generally people will fast forward to the top of, uh, like Anthony's image here, looking at the outer shell and determining if something's bad or not, but it's really easy to look underneath and say, oh man, there's a lot of stuff in here to pick at and determine, um, you know, What's malware? What's good and bad? What's shady? What what needs to be kicked out of the network? Yeah, it's kind of crazy that things really haven't changed that much underneath. I don't know yep. when things are going to change. You know, realistically, that that's that's quite a few years out. Maybe some of the quantum computing side of things might correct some of that stuff. But once it stops the... working, yeah, once exactly. once ransomware campaigns stop making money and things need to change, then they'll change. But until then, they're yeah. going to do the same exact thing. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> yeah. Nice. Um, you know, and, and to, to that effect over there, right? Uh, th this slide sort of carries on th that, that whole narrative that we're talking about right now. And I think that image of the door just being <laughs> unlocked with the key sitting inside of it, that is a little bit more reflective of what we're seeing out there from incidents and, and malware as well, too, like that ability to pivot looking for other machines looking for simple user permissions that are just exposed um, to that effect you know tactics themselves are actually a lot more focused on oversight much more often than skill required uh, if you are a little bit more new to the to the game over here learning about cybersecurity itself uh, for those of you also in the field and the audience too you know I, I think maybe you might have a little bit more exposure to this but I think you're starting to to see as well that um, you know, it's easier, it's less time consuming, you don't have to come up with some advanced custom malicious script through layers of, encrypt, uh, of encryption and hiding behind processes when the door is simply just left open and, and the key is still on the doorknob. Um, and, you know, th there's a couple core reasons for that. 
there's a lot of that abstraction and that image that we just showed before with uh you know windows looks a lot nicer there's a lot of new guis so graphical user interfaces it's a lot of different ways to interface with computer systems mobile devices kiosks you name it and so forth any kind of device that's connecting over the wire uh, all that abstraction essentially requires a lot less skill by the operator um, I mean, I remember when I was growing up and I was I was messing around with DOS before Windows. If you wanted to actually use a computer, you really needed to know how to understand what was going on behind the scenes, mess around with the memory, um, change different config files. If you wanted to install a program or run another one, you actually needed quite a bit of that under the hood skill of being able to operate the computer for any reason. And then that GUI sort of abstracted that. And essentially it's left a lot of the defenders with kind of a set it and forget it mindset of let's just grab the a latest tool. Let's just grab a SIM out there uh, to monitor incidents and different types of events. And uh, we're just going to watch a board. We're going to look at, at different types of charts and it's going to let us know when something's wrong. But that's not really, I guess, Good. I, I mean, I think if that was the case, if there was that silver bullet out there, uh, we wouldn't be having incidents like we do. So clearly there's a bit of a disconnect between having all these uh, dashboards and charts and graphs showing how well your your network is performing and, hey, you need to look at this alert because there's something malicious there. If, if that was the case and it was working, we wouldn't be seeing these incidents like we're seeing. And I think that's sort of the logic, you know? Yeah, I think... Um... I think something that maybe people who are new to the industry um, assume, and it's it's probably a very normal assumption and probably something most people would make, is that security tools um, do really work very well. And um, that's a bad assumption. <laughs> they don't, they, they work maybe in a function of, you know, what they were intended to do. But I think a lot of people use them as crutches, like you mentioned, Anthony, and, um, you know, like, depend on them way more than what they should. And part of that is because um, it's easy to, right? You can just look at your alert queue and see, oh, did something pop up that I need to go look into or, or you know, or not. So uh, one of the things too, that, that maybe is a, another assumption that people um, coming into cyber fall into is thinking that malware is gonna be super obvious. Um, so if you've never seen malware running on a machine before, and I'm not talking about like, you know, when you're, when you're a teenager and you got a pop up on your computer where your antivirus popped up and said Trojan detected, right? That's, that's obvious. And, and a lot of people, I think, assume that that's going to be the case, um, with more advanced stuff, but it's not the more advanced malware looks like a normal windows process. It looks like a normal windows service. You. If you had no idea what you were looking at, you would just assume this is a normal part of the operating system. So part of part of what needs to change in in industry in general is um, and and training is how how to identify what is good and what is bad. Um, if you have any exposure to like the SANS training stuff, they have this really great poster called No Evil. Um, it's free online. You can you can find it if you Google it, um, and it's a pretty good like poster to just outline general windows services um, on linux there's a similar poster as well but um, knowing what is normal and not normal is a lot harder than it seems um, and malware really blends in the kind of the terminology there is blending in to the noise um, and that way when a, a security person kind of comes in to check on the logs or look at something they're just uh, you know, they're having a much harder time finding the needle in the haystack because it's not obvious. The name of the malware is not malware.exe. It's something like Windows Service Updater.exe or something much more, um, you know, vanilla than what you're, you'd be expecting. Yeah. Um, I mean, to piggyback another on, an, on the, your third bullet here, one of the biggest problems with the security industry as a whole is just basic hygiene and this gets this gets slammed a lot um and adversaries really take advantage of this because they know most organizations out there don't even have any idea how many computers are on their network right like how can you defend what you don't even know that you have you could potentially have a, a small business that maybe you know a small office that has 10 computers on it that's pretty 
pretty easy and simple to keep track of. But once you start getting bigger and bigger and you get to the thousands and tens of thousands of computers and hosts, you can see where the scale problem, um, be it becomes much harder to track everything that's on your network. You got phones, you have laptops, computers, servers, IOT devices, all sorts of things. And if you can't keep track of these things, um, your job becomes much harder. Yeah, definitely. I think you, I think all the audience is going to really, uh, think they might be tired by the end, Rob, with all of us hitting them saying, it's just the basics guys. It's just the basics. Like <laughs> yeah. keep, you know, know your hosts, know your permissions, know your user accounts. Um, but yeah, it, it does kind of keep falling back that kind of stuff. Yep. Mm -hmm. Sadly, it's true. Yep. Mm -hmm. Uh, we also posted the, uh, sans evil, uh, no evil poster inside of the chat and discord as well too. You guys uh, take a look at that it's a pretty cool thing if you are working in a soccer now security operations center or you're just kind of getting started at home keep that up keep that tab print it look at it absorb it know it all <laughs> <laughs> um okay so in terms of some of the adversary tactics now let's uh, let's start diving into some of this stuff so phishing emails right i think everybody feels super confident that they're not going to get fished they're like, no, I'm not going to click on that Excel file. I'm not going to click on that thing that says payroll for one of your pay slips. No, I'm not going to click on that meeting invite. I, I, I can tell 100%. It's not, I'm never going to be fooled. Well, think again. Think again. Uh, phishing is actually very successful. It's very valid. It works really, really well. It uh, kind of plays into a lot of the psychological vulnerabilities of, of our psyche, um, you know, human nature, just, just how we operate, how we think. It plays on a lot of those kinds of vulnerabilities. And unfortunately, uh, it's sort of inherent to human nature. You know, we can feel pressured. We can feel sort of coerced. Uh, we can feel fear. And that makes people click on things sometimes without even thinking it. It's sort of like a base instinct. You don't even realize it until it's too late. I, I know this personally, I've, I've had to triage systems from users that have clicked on things. And, you know, th th these are some of the users that you would never, never expect. But if they're distracted, maybe they spilled their coffee while they were clicking around and they weren't thinking and they just said, oh, I got to I got to submit that. There's so many little things that could happen. And I think, you know, if you ever come across, there's actually a really good resource out there called the Verizon Data Breach Report, which I'm going to pull some of the stats and show in this presentation. Again, stats are stats, so not 100%, but at least it's close enough to give us an idea that, you know, where there's smoke, there's fire. And you can sort of see that phishing itself has been present in 36% of breaches, up from 25% in 2020, okay? Um, a quick math over there, that's, that's one in three people essentially will click on a phishing email. I've personally ran phishing campaigns against companies, ethically, mind you, part of contracts, that as soon as I launched it, I had user credentials from multiple users within minutes. And this is how it usually happens. It goes really, really quickly. You get what you need. And then all of a sudden you have user credentials and you can get into accounts. And because these accounts are typically trusted, the behavior you can perform from there is not going to get inspected. And if you rely on poor permissions at that point, there's nothing stopping you from pivoting to another user in the network. So food for thought, something to think about, uh, especially, you know, those of you in the field right now attending, phishing is huge. That is a huge adversary tactic. And for those of you getting started, um, that is something to definitely start getting, fam you know, familiar with after you've learned the technical foundations of how that actually happens. Yeah, I just want to add in there from the defender's perspective, a lot of people like to blame users for phishing, right, uh, vulnerabilities or, or exploits. And, um, I mean, the cynic in me thinks like phishing will never go away. Um, it's still, it's always going to be useful to attackers. Um, it's always going to be an easy way in, um, because if you imagine sort of a network in a virtual, uh, sense, like a castle, it's got a big wall around it. Um, that's like the firewall of the network, right. It's protecting the outside of the network, but the users are all inside of the castle in the courtyard. They can all talk to each other, work and do their business. So if you can throw a, throw a hook over the wall and a user will grab it and pull you over, um, that is one of the easiest ways to get into a network and it still is used today. Um, and I don't think it's ever going to go away. I think it's kind of going to be like, I, I sort of, um, have an analogy of, of fishing to like car accidents. Like as long as we have cars, we're going to have car accidents, but with cars, we've had 
you know, technology that has helped us make them safer and make you, you know, a little more able to survive a really bad wreck, like seatbelts, airbags, and things like that. And I think that's what email is going to be like, as long as we use email the same way we use it, we're always going to have phishing. But, you know, from the security perspective, we need to come around it and figure out how do we help users and protect them and our networks as much as possible. Yeah, I like that. I like that analogy, Rob, especially the airbag, you know, accidents are going to happen. You just have to make sure that there's minimal impact at that point, right? Yeah, um, but as an adversary, you know, it still is a very easy way in the door. So oh, yeah. it's a good thing to practice. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Easy win for those of you in the field and getting started. If that's something you want to start, you know, tightening up in your organization, that can definitely tighten up your security overall. And it's it's much easier to roll out, you know, phishing campaign awareness training, just showing people how you can identify a malicious email. Um, once you kind of learn how, it's much easier to roll that out than some technical access controls, which require a lot of time and resources. So it's sort of an easy win. But yeah, just part of the adversary repertoire. Um, and this is just a little staff kind of following that over here uh, to sort of hit home a little bit more. Um, some of the other types of attacks that we're seeing sort of trending with, with adversaries more, more than others. Uh, we're going to touch base a little bit more deeper on the web app side as well too. system intrusion itself, uh, you know, that usually that usually follows when you have a phishing campaign that was that was successful. Social engineering for those of you, um, you know, that's where phishing campaigns actually fall into social engineering. You're, you're, you're manipulating a person's psyche to feel like it's okay to do something that they may not want to do. And that's what social engineering relies upon. Um, Kevin Mitnick is a, I, I love referring to him. He's a fantastic resource for this kind of thing. He's kind of the, uh, the, the father of social engineering, if you will, for everything in the, the InfoSec cybersecurity industry. He's got one of his lines uh, without me saying directly, sort of paraphrasing, uh, sort of paraphrasing, you know, that uh, you can have the best security controls, uh, but if you walk into an organization with a box of donuts, people are probably gonna let you in. They're not really gonna question that. And that's sort of like a bit of a nutshell of what social engineering is about. That could lead to someone getting inside of an organization, popping in a USB, um, bumping into a user saying, you know, I lost my ID card, can I get inside there? Oh, I lost my account access. And, and that's really how it, how it happens. It doesn't have to be that much more complicated than that. So just some, some food for thought and some numbers over here. Again, it's not that crazy of a hacking uh, campaign sometimes. Um, and then a little bit more into this sort of echoing, uh, you know, 85% of breaches involve the human element. So again, that kind of echoes back to the whole technical access side of controls that uh, adversaries really can just sort of dance around them with humans involved. These, these automated controls aren't doing enough because if they were, we would see this number vastly change. It would be quite, quite the opposite at this point. Right now, people are relying on the fact that humans themselves are going to be the point of vulnerability. They're going to be the weakest chain. So the tools that, that at this point mean that they can be circumvented and that if users were trained, they could probably stop these incidents. And this is what adversaries rely upon. And that's what we're going to be talking about soon for those, uh, for, there's a Top Gun reference coming, you know, defenders need to know how to switch from missiles to guns. You got to know how to learn how to, how to dogfight manually. You got to know the foundations to be able to defend things. We're going to get to that. Um, all right. So going into the web application side of things. So why do we keep seeing web apps always a huge point of one of the one of the um the vectors in in some type of campaign some type of attack and if you really look at it right here you know web application is involved in i don't know what that number is over there 89 percent of breaches well i think i think we all know we all use web apps every single day our, our banks are online everything whatsapp facebook the TikTok crowd <laughs> you know all these things um web apps are just part of our daily life right now so why are they so vulnerable and why do adversaries love web apps well let's dig into a little bit of web app 101 history over here and talk about sort of a core vulnerability and why adversaries are always going to look for web application vulnerabilities and why there always will be vulnerabilities with web applications i can't say that 10 times fast so if we look at this right here, there's a bit of a core vulnerability and that web applications themselves are built off an older protocol. All right. And this protocol essentially accepts any form of user input. And the server has to process 
the input. If you didn't have this mechanism, you wouldn't have your websites or your web apps or anything that you have today. So if you change the way that mechanism works, everything in the world is going to break right now. And that is a core vulnerability behind web applications that will not go away. And what this really means, the adversaries, what they're doing is, and this is the sort of hit a point home that it's a lot of those local internal web applications or older legacy web apps that people are still using within organizations that won't receive patches or those airbags, you know, to go back to Rob's analogy of sort of minimizing impact that uh, users, attackers can literally just spam web apps and mobile apps and anything that accepts that core web application protocol. They can put code within the URL, code within user input um, after they submit application so like if you're on your bank and you say deposit you can actually intercept that request and you can change the parameters after the website has received it and this is what adversaries do and they can literally just send thousands of commands on mass sit back and all they're looking for is one error if they get that error which i mean realistically who is going to be in charge or responsible to catch ten thousand errors and think of all these errors right so if the adversary catches one error that's all they need and then they could bypass any type of well most authentication and authorization controls. That's the core vulnerability we're dealing with with web apps and adversaries love that. I love that. <laughs> yeah, let's talk about um, <clears throat> like, where is the web app? Like I, I used the analogy previously about the castle wall. Sometimes companies will have um, a public facing web server website, right? Like everything, YouTube online and you know, our website. Every company these days pretty much has an external facing website. Um, some of them are super simple. They don't take any user input, maybe just like a contact us form or something like that. But uh, many companies have internal web pages and websites and things that they use for day-to-day -day business where HR can submit a paper or finance can upload documents and, um, organizations think like, well, our external facing website is nice and secure. There's no way attackers can get into it. Um, and then they just completely forget about all of their internal web apps. So they don't pay as close attention security wise to what's running inside of the castle walls. Um, so once a phishing campaign is successful and somebody gets in an attacker can then look for those internal web apps and then, you know, move up the chain of, of privileges by accessing that internal web page that maybe has very weak, um, security, uh, in place. So that's just one way that they can move laterally within the network to gain access. Maybe that web app is like the database for the entire organization. And as soon as somebody gets in and they get access to that, it's game over. That's all it takes. I mean, um, one, I mean, a notable case of that, if you guys remember is the, um, the Experian hack, right? A few years ago with the, um, it started with an external web app, but that's what gave them, um, access to get inside. So the difference there was that there was a crack in the castle wall and the attackers could kind of come in through the wall. They didn't have to use a phishing campaign, but there's many, many, many unheard stories where attackers got in over through the castle wall, through phishing or some other exploit. And then they had free reign when they were inside because the security tools were not ready to detect them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Again, stuff. That's the basics. This stuff has been around for decades. The web protocol it was designed way back when it operates the same way <clears throat> just as vulnerable um we also had a question pop up from the audience mentioning uh, man in the middle yep that's sort of what we were talking about that ability to intercept requests after they've been submitted if you can get right in the middle of that connection that's what's called the man in the middle attack and uh, at that point you have free leeway to do whatever you want with that request and no one's the wiser ideally um so let's take a little bit now we've talked about some entry points right phishing web apps um the social engineering aspect let's talk quickly a little bit about now that you're in the network so this is actually a sna snapshot from a tool called bloodhound which is an amazing tool for defenders um and also red teamers pen testers to poke around um, and look for these vulnerabilities we're talking give us a little bit of an infographic a little visual data representation of what we're actually seeing take a look at this picture over here i've highlighted domain admins over there with the little red circle and if you can get to domain admin you're essentially holding the keys to the network a lot of organizations 
your users out there are maybe one to three to several steps away from domain admins. And all it takes is an oversight and permission configurations. And that's what adversaries rely on. Now that we're in, we've sort of gotten to a user account. Say we've gotten to Bob over here. All we need is, well, he's actually a member of domain admins in this snapshot. So if we got to Bob, we're good to go. So Bob may not even know he's part of the do domain admins, but if we're there, we're good to go. But maybe if we landed on Alice over here, well, Alice might be a member of the support group. Maybe Alice is supporting your internal uh, ticketing support application for user uh, problems, incidents, and customer resolution. Now, what if support is also actually a member of the IT support group? You might need that configured for certain applications and things to work properly in the back end. And that might be fine. But if we got to Alice, who's part of these groups, who is also now part of this workstation client too, in the bottom left, all we need to do is find a way to maybe get over to Bob. And then we're domain administrator. It doesn't take that much difficulty in these types of scenarios. If we landed into a workstation and we're a local administrator, which is like a layer below domain administrator, um, just a matter of time, really, at that point, we can pretty much stay very well and undetected, stay within the system, persist and look for cache credentials, and then we can crack them. Or we don't even need to crack them because there's a core vulnerability with the way that this authorization mechanism works in the back end where you can just submit encoded credentials. You don't even need to know what the password is. And you could assume that user and make requests on their behalf. That's been existing for a while now. Um, Anthony, I just have a question that is a bit away from like the technical aspects of this and just like a bit more around the context of these tactics and when an adversary actually gets into a business, what the ramifications are to that business. And like I read a stat this morning that um, most small businesses that are compromised by malware end up closing their doors within six months because the compromise is that bad. Um, can we just like go over like the context of once these like adversaries are in, what are they looking for and how much damage can they realistically do to a business? Yeah, that's, that's a good point. So to sort of dial it back about motive and intent, um, a lot of this is financially driven. A lot of these campaigns are financially driven, um, much more than maybe defamation, trying to ruin the reputation of a company. A lot of this is financial. So what that means, what does it look like? Uh, you might want to try to get to a position where you're obtaining the account credentials of maybe accounts payable, a controller, someone that has access to company records and HR. That's what you're sort of looking for. Once you've got the keys to the network, and you may not actually need the keys to the network if the permissions are poor, you can maybe get to that HR or accounting user and get access to company records, databases. Um, at that point, we're seeing this everywhere that's when you can hold the company ransom, right? That's when you can say, I've got your data. What are you going to do about it now? I want money. And that's what a lot of people are doing. And a lot of people don't have good backup solutions. So they fall victim, they fall prey to this and they do end up paying. And we're talking millions of dollars. So yeah, ransomware is a pretty, um, ransomware is like a unique um, sort of way that attackers will go after a, a, a network. Generally, it's a quick, <clears throat> for lack of a better term, smash and grab type of job where they don't care about being stealthy about things. As soon as they get access, they're going to race to start encrypting as many things as possible. Um, they're, they're still going to do stuff like this that's on the screen to try to elevate privileges and get other people's passwords so that they can get to other machines. Um, but really their, their um, you know, motive is to capture this organization and hold them ransom like a cyber pirate, right? Like they're holding it, they're holding the musket to their head and saying like, give us the bag of gold or we're gonna delete all your files. Um, that's what ransomware looks like. And it's, it's very scary. And like Anthony said, most people are not prepared for it. Um, some, another way to look at it would be, what if this is kind of circling back to like APTs, advanced persistent threats, like those nation states and those like really scary kind of bad guys that most of us day to day are never going to encounter um, unless you really work at one of those organizations or some high profile place that one of these APTs really want access to. Um, it's it's pretty rare to, to encounter an APT, but they work definitely much differently. Um, 
APTs are going to spend most of their time um, casing the organization. And by casing, that's kind of that old school uh, PI term where they're just like parked across the street with binoculars observing what's going on. So they're gonna spend a bunch of time trying to figure out how does this organization work? Uh, where do they keep the gold? Where are the files that I'm interested in? If it's purely espionage, they don't wanna get caught. So they're gonna be as low and as slow as they possibly can. Um, for example, in this, like they wouldn't run a tool like Bloodhound. They wouldn't run Mimi Cats or some well-known hack tool. They would probably be writing their own stuff and they would be much more deliberate and um, quiet about what they're doing. And then they'll space it out over days, weeks, and months so that an attack of that nature um, would take, you know, a year or two to complete. But their end goal is to get to something that is well-guarded and private that they that they're interested in you know in, in in a nation state sense if it's like spying on a foreign government they want to know what the government is doing what their plans are what their military is doing that sort of information um you know cyber gangs don't really care about that kind of stuff cyber gangs want to do ransomware they want to make money um so they're going to be a lot faster louder um and so you kind of have to have different playbooks for either one of those uh circumstances yeah, definitely. Right. And and Rob, you, we don't always need to see threat actors encrypting files either, right? If they just, if they get the goods, they can hop out and say, I've got your stuff. They don't even need to worry about encrypting data at that point and kind of holding the company ransom that way. So, so what organizations would be like high profile targets and what organizations would be like at least likely to be hit? Yeah. 95% yeah. of organizations are not high profile. Um, <laughs> they're just normal organizations. That top 5% is what I'm referring to is uh, like federal, our federal, I'll, I'll take, I'll keep the context in the United States. So um, our federal government and particularly our military organizations, um, you know, are, are, you can, you can think in the top of your mind, like the top level agencies here, FBI, NSA, CIA, those are top priority targets for our foreign adversaries to spy on. They want to know what we're doing. What are we building? What are we um, doing as far as like campaigns against other nations, right? We, we do it too, right? We spy and we, we try to keep our government informed of what the rest of the world is doing. And everybody has that, you know, poker face on, nobody's telling the truth. So all these, all these organizations and all these countries are playing the same game. Um, and it is that game right now. Uh, we talked a little bit about cyber power in the beginning, but in the past, right, you can imagine the past year, we've had several of those change from intelligence gathering into something more dangerous, which is affecting like physical world things. Like um, the examples I'm uh, thinking of is like the pipeline attack that we had, where the it, it was a ransomware attack. You know, it wasn't necessarily a for an adversary doing it, but the repercussions are the same. And what, what would stop somebody like, you know, China, for an example, from doing the same thing, if they wanted to cause chaos in the United States, they could go after a power company or an oil company or et cetera. You, you can imagine those are high profile things, um, low profile things, um, <laughs> Shopify, you know, YouTube, nobody really cares there might be some there might be some like um proprietary technology that somebody might be interested in right for example like um some country could want to know how spacex builds this particular component of their rocket ship so they might try to infiltrate spacex the company and get to their blueprints server and and download that information um so there's a, there's so many there's so many there's a wide variety of reasons why these people want to get in, and um, that's kind of what makes it hard. It's there's no one size fits all like Anthony mentioned. There's no silver bullet to stop all of them. You have to have a layered approach with multiple different playbooks to handle them. We mm -hmm. have another question um, from the audience. Um, are smaller businesses and organizations hit more because they lack the resources to have a security budget and hackers know local law enforcement will never go after them? <laughs> yes. Yeah, definitely. Um, 
they don't even have people, a security team. Yeah, they most small organizations, and when I say small, let's let's put a number to it, right? What is a small organization versus a medium versus a large or enterprise kind of place? Small organization is generally like less than a hundred people. There's there's variance in that. Some people might go a little bit bigger than that or might be smaller than that, but it's like a hundred people or less. You can think small organizations are like a mom and pop shop, um, a small office, maybe a maybe an accounting firm or or you know a donut shop. It could be anything like that. Wherever they have computers that they manage, you know, a small number of users, and um, they might have something. They might have some money that they could pay a ransom to. Um, that's how attackers would look at it. Medium sized businesses go from a hundred to um, maybe up to a thousand. Um, and then enterprise is anything bigger than that. Um, it, it, and it, and the, the lines blur, right? So it's not an exact definition, but usually again, the motives of the attackers are dependent on what they're going after. Each group has their own motivation. APTs have their motivation, ransomware gangs, um, anything script kitties, right? They're just playing around trying to break stuff. They're looking for low hanging fruit to get into, uh, into organizations to practice and see what they can find because they're curious. Um, still dumb and still dangerous, but not as bad a threat as like an APT would be. Um, so yeah, that's, and then as far as it goes is like, who's at, who's more at risk? It depends on who's coming after them. Mom and pop shops don't have security organizations. They don't have a SOC. They don't, most of them don't even have a permanent security person or IT person, right? They usually hire out um, like an IT firm that once a week, the guy will come in or a gal and, and run updates, install a new printer and then leave. And then they have no IT person there constantly watching their technology. Mid-sized organizations might have a team of two to three people um, to manage hundreds of computers. And their job is, you know, they're, they're spread so thin that they don't have the time to investigate every single alert that pops up on, you know, on one of their systems. Enterprise companies and really big companies obviously have a lot more money. They have teams, various teams doing different things in their organization. Somebody's just watching the network. Somebody's just watching each, you know, the endpoints, the computers. Somebody's designing new things all the time. So, um, yeah, funding is a big part of it. Law enforcement um, does come into play a little bit, but at this point, yeah, the, the law enforcement can't do anything. Well, local police, what are they going to do, right? In, in most in most cases, you know, most cases these attacks are being um, they're being conducted from overseas, so law enforcement has no no way to do anything other than call the FBI. FBI can't really do anything because they're a federal United States federal organization. They don't, they do do some international things with like Interpol and, and our, you know, partner countries, but for the most part, not unless it's like some really big campaign. Um, so really they have no repercussions. That's why it's so prolific right now. That's why so many people are getting hacked right now too. It's like, there's nothing to stop them. Um, until one of the bigger organizations gets involved and they make a mistake. Like our evil was the, um, or Revil, however you want to pronounce it was the latest example of that mm -hmm. where they went after Kaseya and some of the other bigger organizations. Um, and that made a stink in the ransomware community. So the ransomware community, it's believed kind of ganged up on them and told them to stop because they're making too much noise. So like even within their own organization, they told these people to like chill out you're make this is bad for business. Huh. We need to keep ransomware going and you're make, you're messing it up. So, you know, it, there's a lot of politics involved. There's a lot of like, like Anthony said, there's this big story behind it and it's not really, um, it's interesting to know it. It's interesting to understand it, but, um, you know, it's, it's just part of stuff you kind of pick up from being in the, in the, in the industry. Um, but in the reality of things, like it still operates the same way, whether it's Revil or it's, you know, your local ransomware gang that's <laughs> causing trouble. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. Awesome. I'll get off um, my soapbox with ransomware now. Sorry. <laughs> it's a big topic. I mean, it's just on the increase too, right? So something you really got to be aware of. Uh, another point to add on that too, right, um, is if you're not sure if a lot of these terms still seem kind of un unfamiliar, 
to put it plainly, if you're working in an organization that stores companies, um, sorry, stores clients, customers, uh, credit card information, like hotels, uh, if you process health card information for, uh, for your customers and you store it, you're a target. Those are things people are looking for. Um, if, if you're still not familiar with a lot of things we're talking about, that's, that's an easy way to kind of think about it. Just if I can share like one quick anecdote about um, the company I used to work for, we were an investor relations software company. So we had a lot of proprietary data about like earnings reports um, and things like that before it was released to the public. Um, and our security team was catching, I think about um, between like five to 10,000 attacks a day on our hosted sites. So definitely busy. Doesn't stop, doesn't stop. And that's actually sort of, that's a good segue into this slide. That, that image on the left with the door, right? You're just waiting for one of those requests to be open. Um, those 5,000 tax hitting Sarah's previous employer. Well, if they just find one of those doors that's open, bam, it's all we're looking for. So we're gonna hit you on mass and we won't make much too, too much noise when we do it. Or actually we might not care if we make too much noise sometimes doesn't really matter sometimes, but what we're really looking for is that. And you know, the ideal scenario is sort of the image on the right is if we just had a system that could pick up and say that is a threat, that would be ideal, that would work. But I think for some of the reasons that we're talking about right now, um, I think it's kind of evident that it's not really possible. So this is where the human element comes in and that's where that 85% of breaches had a human element that still failed as a result this is why that human element needs so much attention this is why there's such a shortage this is why there's such a demand this is why we need defenders because adversaries right now this is a gold rush you know and from my experience of being a simulated adversary it's it's like shooting fish in a barrel, a barrel. it's it's an easy target it doesn't take much effort at this point um and to that effect here's another thing that adversaries like to um circumvent and that's your antivirus. It's your endpoint detection and response systems. It's your Windows Defender. It's keeping you safe. That's sort of referred to as AMC. Um, so why doesn't it work? I mean, we have AV, we have EDR, we have AMZ, we have Windows Defender, we have all these different types of tools. I'm going to show you a little chart after this. Why doesn't it work? Well, a lot of these things, for all intents and purposes, are looking for known threat actors. So you know, if someone's going to break into your house and you know what a criminal might look like if they're running in and they have like the mask on, you know, like that stereotypical figure, they're going to they're going to rob you or like a bank robber. You know what that person looks like. Easy. You know how to spot them and say, yep, that person is definitely going to commit a crime. You know that um, Windows Defender and AV and EDR for intents and purposes essentially works the same way. It's saying, I know that that piece of network traffic that's happening right now in the back end or that process that just started up or that window that the user just opened or that Excel file that they clicked on. Yeah, I know that's a threat. I'm going to quarantine it. So I think you can see a bit of the problem here, right? If these tools essentially work on known identified threats and vulnerabilities, all you need to do is change your appearance. And that's how a lot of these things are circumvented. And unfortunately, a lot of these tools that are out there to set it and forget it your defense systems are looking for rudimentary pattern matching they're just trying to identify something that they know is malicious and unfortunately they have to be built that way because if they were just catching everything and saying everything's a threat you get a ton of false positives and your system's probably not going to work properly so by design again going back to the design issues at hand that have existed for some time they have to work this way so they are inherently not perfect and they are inherently not able to identify and catch all the threats and that's what adversaries also rely upon they just change their mask they cover up the code that they're doing they make it look normal no one's the wiser and right now there is no software or AI or technology that can do this foolproof. There's no human that can do it foolproof either. Again, there's no silver bullet. You kind of need a combination of both. You need something to catch all of the known stuff to get rid of the noise. So you need these solutions, but then you need the human element to come in and say, okay, now that it's telling me everything is safe, I don't believe you. I'm going to go and make sure that things are safe. I need to know that I know. And that's where the humans come into this. So that's kind of a bit of a high level of why these things 
definitely fail. And that image on the left is essentially how easy it is. You just take a shortcut and you're around it. So again, they're there for the low skilled little script kitties sending something your way, someone testing your defenses. That's what these solutions are there for, to catch the stuff that is guaranteed and known and get rid of the noise for you. And then that way, all those lower skilled threat actors are filtered out. And then the more advanced ones will find their way around. And then the humans need to come in with their skills to switch from missiles to guns. All right, talking a little bit about performance. Here's a bit of a, a nutshell. This was a study done uh, recently, actually, this year that looked at some of the, the top high end. These are the most expensive EDR solutions in the market right now. And on the right, you may not know what these attack methods are, but these are very common forms of encoding or obfuscating or encrypting uh, malicious code inside of trusted, trusted applications, trusted files. Just like how you would open up that Word document, you could hide something that's that HTA, you could put it inside the Word document. You can see here exactly how many of them have failed to detect the threat. And this is just on the, the sample set that was run against them. This is not even including the thousands of more different ways you can st still continue st to send samples to get through them. What this image is really demonstrating is just how imperfect the current solutions are right now for antivirus and endpoint detection and response systems there's you look at this right away and you can tell you know for it's interesting that there's one of them that was able to catch them all um with f secure elements i haven't personally used that one but i'd be curious to see you know some more data on that to kind of pick at that a little bit further but this should give you a bit of a ballpark idea of just how easy it is to get around even the best of the best these have the best professionals designing the software right now and they're still circumventable Um, that being said, sorry, kind of knocked off my little headset over there. I like to talk with my hands a lot. Um, let's move over to uh, incidents. So this is actually something that is really recent right now. This is just a vulnerability that's been, um, been broadcasted. It, ha it, ha it hasn't made much noise, but essentially, um, Corporate networks right now that are hosting a web server internally with some of the native design Microsoft web server software. If they're hosting internal web applications, maybe like their user ticketing system, their customer management solutions, um, their hotel guest tracking systems, etc. If they're hosting it internally right now, um, and a lot of companies do have this service running just by default, this stuff is enabled by default, you could easily just send a simple request to that web server and pretend that you're another agent in the network and that web server will just go right on ahead and give you the keys you need to pivot to a critical service that allows and governs what all users can do. It takes all of maybe a minute, maybe less, and you do not need to be registered as a domain user. And domain user means that you're an actual employee of the company and IT has set you up and gave you an account. You could be a guest on the network right now, send this request out, and that's as easy as doing a quick scan of the network, finding the web server, send the request, put in this fake certificate, comes back to you, it says, here you go. And this has been around a while and there's no patch for this there's what the IT team needs to do at this point is essentially disable the way that they're governing and providing access to all employees and redefine their authorization mechanism behind the scene. And I don't know, for those of you that are still kind of new, that's a lot of time, a lot of money, a lot of resources, and a lot of testing and a lot of offline of your equipment to make sure that everything still works. That's really the only solution to even verify if that works. And you may not even be able to do that solution based on the way that you've configured your company. That's out there. So that's a bit of a recent incident starting to kick around. I think we're going to see some more noise on this one. It doesn't even have an official um, attack name right now, like some of the other ones. And we're going to talk about that in the next slide over here. Um, this one, we talked a little bit our, in our last presentation, actually, but I want to bring it up again because it's so applicable. And this is really an, an easy one to understand for some of the newcomers in the audience that, uh, and this has a name, it's called the, the Serious Sam Bug. We've heard about Print Nightmare and these other ones kicking around right now too, live, is that Windows went ahead and they they patched Windows. They, they applied a patch and some updates for users to apply. And what it did was it allowed a database that stores all of your encrypted, secure, stored credentials 
to be completely readable. Anyone can read it. Here's a screenshot of someone just running a simple command. Everyone has this command built in their PowerShell right now. If you're running a Windows system at home, run that command against your SAM file. And if you see built-in users with that Rx, you are vulnerable. And if someone's on your system and they're able to look at that, they can get your stored password information and you'll never know. This is right now in the wild. There's again, no patch for this right now. And this is just simply, this has been around for a while too. No one even detected it. Someone just caught it one day, but this is an oversight. Again, remember I talked about in the beginning of this presentation, what are these adversaries relying on? Oversights. Someone didn't think about this. They rolled out a patch. No one even caught it. There's no software that's going to catch this. Someone signed off on it. A number of people developed this patch. Now we're all running it. As soon as I saw this, I, I went at home too, and I looked at my computer. Yep, mine's readable. I didn't even know. And I've got a lot of alerts and things set up to monitor myself. I didn't catch this either until someone told me about it. I'm sure a lot of people have not even fully caught wind of this yet. So again, relying on oversights, that's kind of where we're at right now. We don't, you don't need anything special over here. And when this did drop, um, when I caught wind of it, and uh, I think it, it was Greg inside of our Discord, he, he popped it up. I looked at the link, I was, I was, I was shocked. I was like, this is, this is crazy. I quickly Googled Sirius Sam exploit. Someone had an exploit that I was able to download. Took all of a hot second, be able to run it, good to go. What's stopping all, all of your domain users in the network from doing the exact same thing too? So again, it doesn't have to be complicated. So going back to a little bit about who are they, we talked about them, these advanced persistent threats, that's, that's officially their name, the APTs out there. A little stat on the right, you can see who these people are. Well, these people that are out there that are relying that you didn't change the permissions on your SAM file, or maybe you've got that web server running in your corporate network. They're the ones that have now sent that phishing email campaign in or socially engineered their way in or found a crack in the web app. Now they're looking for these known vulnerabilities that have no patches and that if no one's paying attention to, they're just a matter from that other image that shows how fast you can pivot to a domain administrator and they're good to go. And these are the people that are doing it. Everything that we've talked about today requires essentially zero hacking skills. Just wanted to kind of hit that point home. So you can imagine if someone actually does have a skill set to perform advanced encryption, advanced hacking, uh, different types of maneuvers, you can imagine just how much easier of a time that they'll have, but they don't even need to do that. But these are the people that we're dealing with, right? They're huge, they're significantly funded. There's thousands of these people behind these organizations. And the worst part is that they're not actually always external. They could be internal users that have infiltrated their way in. And going back to the incident we just was reviewing over there, if they're already inside the network and they're posing as an actual employee and they've socially engineered their way in, they can run any of these exploits with ease just as a regular employee. So you don't even need to find a web app vulnerability. <clears throat> That's kind of a little bit about who they are and where we're at. So, talked a little bit about all those different types of adversary tactics. And this sort of leads us to why there's such a big demand. Well, a lot of these employers have recognized that, that they're in trouble. They need people because the tools aren't working. They're not catching them. They can be easily circumvented. And what we're really looking for are people to fill these seats. But a lot of these organizations, some don't even have security programs. They're just grabbing job descriptions and posting it out there saying, I need this person. I need this person with all these skills. And then I'm going to be safe and I can go to bed at night with my eyes closed and I'm not going to lose any sleep. They're looking for these things called unicorns. They're looking for these people. And that's a tech term primarily, which is sort of expanded throughout the industries. But these unicorns are people that will, I think we all know unicorns don't exist. Or maybe they did. I don't know. That's a topic for a different webinar of mythology and stuff. But, um, you know, unicorns don't actually exist, right? And, and, that, and that's just it, is that uh, we have employers that are looking for people with this insane skill set to perform an insanely demanding amount of responsibilities. And that's not working either. So what we really, really need are people just with practical experience and the basics. You don't even need people with advanced skill sets. You just need the basics of security fundamentals, IT and computer fundamentals to be able to perform these tasks, to be monitoring your network and looking for things that are hiding themselves, bypassing AV and EDR, looking for those phishing emails, looking for cracks in the web apps and looking for an update that all of a sudden changed permissions on things. That's what you need. You don't need anything beyond that. 
So that's sort of where the industry, is, it, it, it's getting there. We're still a little bit of ways up, but that's essentially what it needs for employers to really recognize and get through that recruitment barrier of, well, we just need someone who knows the foundations and we're going to be more than good enough and they're, they're just going to get better and better. So that's sort of why we're seeing this kind of crazy demand right now. Until then, let's just keep putting that fire over here with the rest of the other fires. Great show. Please watch uh, the IT crowd. If you ever get a chance, you will laugh a lot. Older show, really funny. Um, okay, so realistically now, this is why we're talking about what we're talking about, because we can't rely on employers to hire people who can sit there and use these fancy bells and whistles and user uh, applications and interfaces that you click a, an easy button says, all right, tell me where the incidents are. I'm going to find them and I'm going to identify them and quarantine them and I'm good to go. Well, that's not working. That's the missiles approach. That's where we need people to switch back to guns and go manual and be able to learn how to use the foundations to identify these things and have a good solid understanding of the fundamentals behind IT, computers and cybersecurity himself. And then just follow those fundamentals and find the threats and hunt them down. And the adversaries won't even see you coming. All right. So in terms of cyber self-help, um, a couple of things you guys can do if you're in the audience right now, uh, things that you should be thinking about are these kinds of terms, uh, risk management, vulnerability management, network analysis, learning about Windows and Linux. And, and truthfully, if I mean, if I could really hit that point home, having a core understanding of Windows and networking is going to serve you so much more than just being able to learn the latest, greatest tool. Um, and then you can start focusing on things like the adversary tactics, and then you can start employing some of the tools that come within these skills, like SIS internals, which is a, a nice advanced uh, skill set with simple, easy to use tools that can use the foundations properly and hunt down these threats. Being able to use the command line, navigating around the system with PowerShell, um, using really cool network traffic analysis tools like Wireshark, and then a technique called Lolvas, which is living off the land binaries that adversaries like to use and use those trusted word docs and stuff against you. That's a little technique for you to uh, look into as well. And a lot of these uh, techniques can be found within something called the MITRE ATT&CK framework, which is a nice framework that sort of highlights and governs what all these threat actors are doing. A lot of things that we've talked about today in today's presentation is all categorized in there based on which advanced person, as, which advanced persistent threat is using which one. So that's something to look into as well. Um, we've kind of put together a little cybersecurity foundations course. It's free for everybody. Check it out on our website. It covers a lot of these concepts and kind of gets you started. If you can get through that, it takes you five to eight hours. Uh, you're going to come out with a much better understanding of just what the landscape is really out there looking like and getting some familiarity with the basics of Windows and Linux right now. So I definitely tell you guys, check that out. It's free. You can do, do it all in your browser. You'll learn a lot of skills. And if you never go into cybersecurity afterwards, at least you know how to keep yourself safe and maybe help some others and your friends. So check it out. Um, and then we'll talk a little bit about our boot camp. So what we do, this is all the stuff we're talking about today. Well, we're going to go and teach you, take you back to the drawing board, like this image on the left. And yeah, we're going to get nice and, and manual with you. And we're not going to let you rely on all these fancy tools. We're going to get you to get back to the basics. We're going to simulate real attacks and real malware. <laughs> Rob has created some really nasty malware to throw at you guys. Um, some nice fun analysis and challenges. And we're going to get you to do a lot of reporting, learn Windows and Wireshark until you're blue in the face to be able to hunt these things down and be able to switch from using those fancy tools to going back to manual and being able to find these threats and, uh, and identify them well in advance. Uh, no experience is required. We're happy to onboard you at this point, just got to get through the foundations course as a requirement. Um, and we have a little bit of a military training method um, that we like to employ, hence our school for cyber advanced maneuvering over here at level effect. And this is your mission briefing and hope you've all enjoyed everything to this date. Um, and then this is just a little bit of a snapshot about what you could sort of expect. You know, if you're hopping inside the course, there's a whole chunk, all those adversary tactics that we're talking about today. This is a lot of stuff that you'll actually be learning inside of the bootcamp. You will learn how to use Windows to break Windows, and you'll learn how to use Linux to break Linux, and then vice versa, overlapping them. And you'll also learn how to employ some fancy little persistence mechanisms to dial back out to you and let you know that you're hooked back in the system without anyone know, noticing or knowing. So it's something to look forward to as well. We got some cool stuff. I'm proud of what we got. We're all proud of what we got. 
hope you guys have enjoyed a little uh, presentation and your mission briefing. You should now feel a little bit more confident and more aware about what's out there and be able to get yourselves up to snuff and up to speed to respond to some of these adversaries. And we'll open it up now to some of this uh, Q&A. Any questions that you guys want to bring up? Happy to answer them. Yeah, I'll get it started. Um, but how much risk are individuals? Um, like we talked a lot about risk in corporations, but how much risk does like the average individual have of just getting hacked um, and getting their, their finances um, compromised? Um, hard to be able to qualify that or quantify that into a number, but I would say it's definitely on the medium to high end, just as a regular person kind of going about their day um, in today's day and age. I mean, I myself have been, I, I've been a victim of being compromised through different devices twice and no, three times in my life. Um, it happens. Even if you think you've got everything tight and secure, you know, you use your phone, you go to the airport, connect to uh, wireless and internet over there, you may not actually be connecting to an actual um, appliance that's providing you internet, it could just be someone else's laptop, and you won't know, and they're going to be sitting in the, in the middle doing man in the middle requests and it intercepting everything you send. That's, that's a very easy way that happens a lot. Coffee shops, people connecting to public Wi Fi, you they could be using your device to mine cryptocurrency. We saw that happening quite a bit before with um, coffee miners kicking around inside of browsers. You log in through that little uh, Starbucks or Second Cup, whatever kind of portal, you know, any kind of franchise, and you think you're logging into a portal, but it's really someone else sitting there in the coffee shop with you, and you don't even know it. So you're you're definitely at a medium to high risk. Um, if you're not informed, if you don't know what's out there, and you don't know how just to be kind of safe and double check and cautious, yeah, it's high, definitely. Yeah, and maybe something touching on that too is like a lot of um, <clears throat> a lot of us remember when credit cards were getting stolen a lot, right? Everybody was afraid of getting your credit card stolen and get stuff charged, and you still hear a lot of commercials about it. And it's it's true there is still there is still a market for that, right? Some cyber crime people that will steal credit card numbers and use them to charge up something, but credit card companies have, have actually come a long way as far as detecting fraud and and blocking those sort of purchases so it's become a lot less lucrative from the you know organized crime side of things to steal credit cards um and another thing would be like identity theft right like 10 years ago identity theft was huge it's slowly declining because the same the same reason as a credit card thing it's like it's much harder to convert somebody's identif identity into something like monetizable for criminals. So you used to be able to get somebody's identity, get their social security number or their driver's license or something, and then sell that on the black market or sell a list of them for a thousand dollars. Now you can buy identities for like a penny because it's just so common and it really doesn't, even if you get, let's say, a, a list of a thousand identities from the black, from the dark web or from the black market, whatever you want to call it, um, most of them are not going to work anymore. It's it's just, and and some of them like there's nothing, there's no money to gain from it. So that has sort of died down, and that's why ransomware has gone up, and more people are getting involved in ransomware because ransomware right now is the most lucrative thing to do. So go and going after organizations that have millions of dollars versus individuals who have maybe thousands of dollars is why the incentive has changed. Um, it is still obviously a risk. You can still download malware where they can mess up your phone or your computer and use it to attack other people. Um, your identity, your accounts can get hacked, right? And you get locked out of your accounts. Um, but in, I think kind of bigger picture, longer term, sort of like the risk to us as individuals has gone down. And the risk to our organizations and governments and stuff has gone up. Yeah, that's actually it's actually definitely a pretty good point. Um, there, there is a bit of a decrease in trend, right? Um, I think we've all seen now in the past couple uh, years that security seems to be first and forefront and paramount. Um, I know Apple 
was hitting that like crazy on their on their media and their commercials and broadcasting that we're now we're now checking everything that you do and get you have to request and grant permissions to everything you install and every little thing that you try to do in your browser and your microphone your cam and permissions there's definitely a lot more attention now um, because i think people definitely realize and figured out that the risk is very high and uh, consumers are getting at least a little bit more support from organizations making their devices and connected appliances a little bit safer for them because it's hard to pick up this kind of skill set of exactly how, how vulnerable you are. It's sort of hard to like understand how vulnerable you are if you don't even know that you're vulnerable, right? Um, so these companies are trying to take action and do a little bit more because uh, there there is more reprimand happening. We're seeing uh, more lawsuits happening to companies for uh, not doing enough. Uh, we're also seeing a bit of an interesting trend now where some organizations are essentially just um, moving the risk of it all and getting getting insurance. There's conversations happening around and a small industry started in the form of cyber insurance. Companies have sort of come to terms that it to and set and they just said that they accepted we're going to essentially have five to 15 percent loss of some of some type, some type of incident. And we're just going to hire an insurance company and um, they're going to sort of take the hit for us. It'll cost us and it's just the cost of doing business. So that's an interesting thing. Yeah, like. Um... The question came up earlier about like law enforcement, like what do, what do people do when they get hacked? Um, for ransomware specifically, like today, what happens for medium, even small organizations, and I'm sure large organizations have some semblance of this, but insurance, like, like Anthony said here, or what will happen is they'll get ransomware, their um, outsourced IT firm will say, Hey, you just, you guys just got hit by ransomware. We weren't able to catch it in time. And, you know, we don't have any backups. So we're kind of, our back is against the wall. What do we do? The first thing that organization does is they call their legal team and they call their insurance provider. They don't call law enforcement. They don't call, they don't call the army. <laughs> like there's nothing for them to really do. Like they know they can't do anything about it. So the best case scenario is can we get an insurance company to help us pay the ransom and we get the decryptor from the ransomware um, organization? Um, how does how does a ransomware organization know how much to charge for ransom, right? That's a pretty good question. If, if I was a ransomware you know, uh, developer and, and I was gonna ransomware a small company, how do I know um, whether to charge them a million dollars versus a hundred thousand um, dollars? Well, if I hack into their system and I gain access to their financial documents, I can look at their bank statements and I can see what is in their savings account. And I'll say, okay, I'll ransom for that number. And I know exactly how much this company is able to pay me before I even ransomware, ransomware them. Um, and you know, and then I don't get anything. So really the, the, it's, it's definitely like a wild west type situation right now with ransomware in particular. Um, there is no repercussions. These ransomware groups are never really found or taken down unless there's just like a lot of pr international pressure put on them. Um, but they're trying to keep their profile low enough that they don't get to that threshold. And then from our standpoint, like if, if we're a business and we get hit, we have no tools to go after them. We have no way to call the police and give them an IP address and say, hey, go arrest these guys. Like that doesn't exist. Um, so we're in like new territory right now, as far as, as crime goes. Yeah. So in the chat, they're saying that the malware developers needs to be sure for the, to charge for training and time off expenses or roll that into the cost of the ransom. <laughs> exactly. I'm right. sure they do. I'm sure they get, <laughs> uh, they get Uber eats too, every, every lunch and yeah. they get everything paid for. Yeah. I mean, they're, they are. Think of them as a professional software organization, just yep. like Twitter or LinkedIn or whatever, Microsoft, but their, their motives are not to make money and get clicks. Their motives are to, I mean, their, their motive is to make money, but it's not from YouTube likes, it's from ransom. Um, so, this might be a bit of a wormhole to go into, but what are the kind of ethics and rules around um, hacking back or i've also heard the term of like proactive uh defense and 
I've heard stories of like, for example, um, a, a company saw a malicious actor coming into their network, going after files. So they basically planted a file that they knew that they could trace um, and got the malicious actor to try and get that, compromise that file. Once the actor clicked on that, they were able to trace who the threat actor was. Um, and then the story kind of fell off of what they did from there because yeah. I don't know if that is even an okay thing to do. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, it is definitely still in the gray area. Um, as far as like, that's why I mentioned like we're in the wild west in the U S for example, I don't, I don't know how we are compared to some European countries or or Canada, for example, like as far as like legal precedent goes for any of this stuff, but the U S is behind. So if you were to hack somebody else's computer, even if it's a hackback situation, you're liable for cyber crime. So, you know, it's sort of like vigilante justice in, in, in any other sense, like murder or, you know, some other crime, like you as a citizen, um, you're not supposed to go get justice for yourself. You're supposed to get law enforcement and bring them to justice so that justice can be served, you know, in a, in a proper format. So that's sort of the, the semblance with hackback. Not only, um, not only is it really difficult to do that. So like your story is a good anecdote, but not, you know, not every instance is going to be that clear cut when if they take a file back and it and it gives you you know their location so first of all it's, it's just super hard to identify who is the one even hacking you if you can if you can get over that burden then like what do you do do you have um like a security organization that has the ability to hack them like do you have a really good red team at your disposal that you can you know take down their infrastructure Probably not. Most people don't, you know, so that that gets like left up to law enforcement. So really, you can just collect evidence and then get get law enforcement involved. What um, what generally has happened, what I mentioned about, like when there's a lot of international pressure, what generally happens there is we sort of know who is doing it. So our our government with other allies will kind of sync up together and say, OK, we know this group is here they're involved in these crimes. Like we have all this evidence against them. So they will go after their infrastructure. So wherever their, wherever their websites are hosted, wherever they're, um, using computers, like the buildings, <laughs> wherever they're paying their utility bills, the governments will go after those companies and say, you need to take this stuff off right now because it's being used for crime against, you know, our citizens. So that's how they'll like take them down. But aside from that, you know, there's not much, there's nothing literally a small organization could do against, you know, hackers as far as hackback. So yeah, usually when I hear hackback, um, I kind of, I kind of laugh. I'm like, what are you, what are you even going to do? Right? Like if you have an IP address, like on your, your network, <laughs> you, you could trace it back to like Latvia or something like what you going to get on a plane and you're going to go like knock on these guys door. <laughs> like there, there is nothing you can do. And when the government talks about it, I get, it, it gives me chills because I know some of the most incompetent people that work there are the ones the most willing to like hit that button and hack them back. Um, or like, you know, God forbid drop missiles and stuff like that's the worst case scenario, but, um, it is, it is a very hard problem to solve. And until, until we figure out better technology to do that. Like right now, we don't really have a reliable way to do hackback, um, mainly because of what I said in the beginning, like attribution. Um, yeah, Aaron hit that too. Attribution is the number one problem. You cannot right now reliably determine who the one is who is hacking you. Mm -hmm. There's just too many. There's too many variables involved, and it's just really, really, really difficult. So something you touch base on there, Rob, you're saying how a lot of these small, uh, medium sized businesses don't even have the capacity to be able to prevent or remediate resolve these kind of incidents that, that happen. Let's go back a little bit to um, the Hafnium breaches that were taking place earlier in the year. Um, that was really interesting because it got to a point that it was so bad, such a critical 
piece of software with Microsoft Exchange being the backbone behind all of your mailing software, all the gateways and all the emails back and forth and everything. It's all managed by that Microsoft Exchange uh, service. So, I mean, that got so bad that there were so many organizations that just couldn't remediate it that the FBI stepped in. We actually had the FBI remoting into companies and either patching out right or disabling or fixing whatever they needed to do to companies just because those companies started to become threats for other companies and started to spread like a nation state vulnerability, a vulnerability to the US. So we saw something happen that has never happened before earlier this year where the FBI, at least publicly, I mean, I don't know what's happening behind closed doors, but at least publicly, they were able to go in and start fixing the problems for companies without their consent. They just went ahead and did it. That was sort of the undertone of a game changer of where we're at right now in the industry. That's It's gotten that bad that the government has to actually step in and start taking matters into their own hands for that type of a vulnerability that almost everybody uses Microsoft Exchange. So. Yeah, definitely. And it's, it was a, probably a line that we can't uncross anymore and figuring out like who's responsible, um, you know, should the government step in every time and, and protect everyone? Is this like a nation level issue or are the companies that are vulnerable, are they responsible? And like, they have something, they have some skin in the game that they should, um, they should get in trouble for not patching their systems or keeping things up to date. The um, part of the problem with the Hafnium thing too, was that the patches that Microsoft put out were sort of delayed and confusing and people didn't know, like, am I patched? Did I run this right? Did I do this right? So, you know, it's not, it's not a clear cut thing. It's not, it's not black and white. Um, so I don't know what the right answer is. The government maybe, <clears throat> I think the government should be involved more about helping people figure it out and enforcing vendors, um, enforcing that vendors should be compliant with security and also also validating that security vendors are telling the truth right now. There's so many security vendors out there that just sell snake oil. Their products don't work. They tout that it's, that it's detecting these things or that it's going to secure your policy for you. And we all know that's fake. That's not real. Um, so there's no, like in, in the U S we have like the food and drug administration that checks drugs and food for safety. We don't have an organization. I mean, we do, we have cyber command we have NSA, we have FBI and CIA that could vouch these vendors and could give them like seals of approval to say like, Hey, this is USDA organic vendor for security here that will actually do these things that it says that it does. Right. You know, we could have things like that. Um, but you know, that's kind of where we're at right now. There's not, um, there's, there's not an easy place to get the truth. Everybody says different things. So it's, it's, it falls on us to kind of dig around and try to figure out what's actually going on. Um, and that's kind of what we're doing right now. Right. Like we've got to get more people in the field to be able to know what to do in with the basics and the foundations down to at least get us to a point, like we need to cross that threshold where there's enough skilled people that can sort of make up for all of this gap right now. And yeah, they can call up. BS on the vendors when they say our AI will catch exactly. everything and all zero it is. Okay, <laughs> get out of my office like exactly. right now. That's ridiculous. Get out of here. So <laughs> yeah, exactly. Knowing the foundations and knowing the basics um, will help you obviously be able to see that and be like, that's that's not possible. That's not true. Um, and if it sounds too good to be true, it usually is. So yeah, we need better training. We need more people who um, just know the foundations instead of go to go to schools and, and boot camps and stuff that they just learn how to click buttons and look at windows, uh, you know, the window panes of the security tools. Um, we need people to actually understand what's going on underneath. Yeah. I think it'd be a pretty good conversation for us to maybe have at some point, a little research and chat about what can be done, right? Like, should government provide like a tax credit that says, here's a founding business credit that you get to put towards a cybersecurity solution? I don't know, but it'd be kind of fun maybe to talk a little bit about that more in depth about what we can do, because the human problem seems to be 
we know we can fill seats, right? Like we can get more people skilled up. Everyone can do that. More humans, more employees, more SOC analysts, et cetera. We'll catch up. But what then, right? Like wh where do we, where do we kind of go from there? That'd be something interesting to dig Yeah. Into. Hopefully it's not, it's not a, I mean, I, I was sort of the cynical part of me thinks that something really dangerous is going to happen with cyber. Um, like we talked about the pipeline thing or in Florida, if you remember in Florida, they hacked somebody hacked a, a water treatment plant, right. And they almost got to the point where they were able to basically poison the water. Yep. Um, I think it's going to be a big event like that at a large scale that hurts a lot of people that makes the government, it forces the government's hand to do something. Um, whether it's our government or somebody else's government, but that's going to sort of be the catalyst of change in, in not the most ideal scenario. The ideal scenario would be that we're proactive about it and we do something before it gets that bad. But the worst case scenario is it gets bad, people die, and then the government makes uh, just some big overreaching rule that doesn't work that well, but we have to comply with it anyway because of that bad event. Right. That's that's usually what happens, sadly, but um, that will cause change. And then hopefully maybe that'll prompt vendors and companies to do better things and, and be more helpful, more proactive. But until then, I don't see much changing. Sadly. No. But that's kind of what the adversaries want. Right. Like you were just saying, like uh, with Kaseya that happened, we had the infighting happening within the adversary saying, hey, stop making so much noise. Let, don't ruin the gravy train. It's good for all of us right now. So yep. let's let's not make too much noise. So if they slip up and it gets to that kind of a scale, then it's kind of bad for them. But you're right. Definitely, that's sort of like what would happen. What it needs to what needs to happen. Yep. Um, <clears throat> that being said, by the way, for the audience, we're, we're definitely just chatting away here with some stuff. Um, I don't see any other questions kicking in. Um, Definitely happy that you guys are sticking around and listening to us. Uh, I guess you like hearing what we have to say. We're saying something that seems interesting <laughs> enough. Um, so thank you for still sticking around. Um, but also to be respectful of time too and all that good stuff. I uh, don't want to hold you here forever too. If there's, uh, we'll give a couple more minutes maybe, just any questions that might pop up in the chat. Um, if there's anything else on your mind, anything about us, about cybersecurity, about where you're at, career aspirations, some recent threats, incidents, anything you want to shoot out there now is a pretty good time. I might um, just for YouTube's sake, I'm going to stop the recording now. <laughs> yeah, fair enough. <laughs>